Okay, here we go. Um, Robin, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, we're so honored to have you as our Themis Chair of the Month um, for June 2021. Um, so first of all, happy Pride Month. That's, we need to start with that. Uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, so we always start this um, small interviews with a quick check in. So I want to ask, how are you feeling today? Uh, warm, because I think it's been the hottest day of the year today. Oh my gosh, yeah, absolutely. We're all melting. Um, so please feel free to have water or ice cubes if you need to, because that's uh, what I might have to do as well. Um, so. Uh, getting into the interview itself, uh, first question I wanted to ask is, what do you miss the most about life pre-pandemic? Uh, do you know, I like, because I'm an employment practitioner and I, I uh, the cases are tried around the country. I love traveling around, mm -hmm. uh, love being somewhere different week to week. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I do cases in Scotland and Northern Ireland as well. So off to Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. um, and it, the clerks can always win bonus points if they manage to find me a case in Edinburgh during the festival. So, uh, but it no, that's I, I've been privileged to travel around a fair bit during lockdown, but equally been doing a lot of cases on by CVP. And I miss, and I, having been doing this for 26 years, I've got friends in most sort of legal friends in most cities in the country. And it's like if you're there for a week, it's oh, who I haven't seen for a while, who shall I have a bite of dinner with? And that's lovely as well. So is Edinburgh your favourite spot? I think it's possibly my favourite city in the UK, second to London. I mean, you know, I'm, an, I'm a Londoner born and bred. But um, I, I've done a couple of cases in Edinburgh in recent years, and I really got, and they're quite long cases, and I got to know the city and really like the city. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely lovely. So um, I do miss traveling as well. Um, so let's go to the juicy bit of, uh, of this interview. Um, you have co-authored a book, uh, super exciting, we can see it. <laughs> and it's a practical guide to transgender law. Um, this is absolutely, <laughs> it's brilliant. Uh, we're so excited to finally have this book um, being published, but can you tell me from your point of view, why do you feel this book was necessary, it was a necessary legal text and needed to be published? Yeah, I think um, it, it was suggested to me by the publishers actually a couple of years ago. And uh, I think trans is still the rarest of the protected characteristics. It's, it's not well understood by a number of people because um, you know, the number of trans people in the country is, I don't know, there are different estimates, but in the working population, it's perhaps between one in 500 and one in a thousand, something like that. So it jumps up to bite people, but not just in, in the world of work, in education and asylum and clubs and associations and sport and everything else that the book covers. So it, it seemed a good idea to draw it all together in one place. It's, uh, it's uh, very exciting and um, I just got my copy, so I'm really looking forward to having mm -hmm. it. Um, and we will um, link it to the blog so everyone can get a copy as well. Um, so now uh, this, I don't know if this is um, touched upon in the book or not, but there are um, obviously many theories that um, talk a lot about um, being trans and what that entails. And um, I just wanna, wanted to know what does it mean, what feminism means to you and um, how do you kind of uh, reconcile the theory um, that you've discussed in your book as well? Well, we do we do have a chapter that's talk that talk. Well, in fact, we have a chapter that's about understanding trends, and a chapter about terminology because people need to get used to that, uh, or, or will they need to get used to that? And I, um, I've had to fight for for my femininity, and that's um, something that not everybody has to do. Um, you know, everybody has a struggle in life. Everybody has difficulties and, and challenges to overcome and what have you. And they'll be different um, for, for, for different people. Um, and I think the fact that you've had tough times in your own life should, if, if you're a, an appropriate human being, make you receptive to helping other people over difficult times in their life. And they can be completely different difficulties. 
I mean, what I love doing more than anything else at the moment is being involved with student lawyers and student, particularly student barristers, um, who are at that moment in their life where it's all possibility and it's all about to open up. And I, I've certainly come across a few trans uh, poor students and bar school students. And if by having been out there uh, along the path ahead of them, um, and, and equally, you know, our school students from diverse backgrounds in other ways, okay? sexual orientation, race, cultural background, whatever. Um, because I think the bar is actually one of the most accepting places to work that I know. And to show that to people and to show people that doesn't matter, you know, that the bits of you that are you that are that make you up and, and are great and and add to you as a person and you as a barrister are great extras and they're not a bar to being a barrister and and if if i've done anything by being slightly further out along the path than other people uh, by showing people that you can walk the path then that's great i mean i can absolutely tell you that you have and um i know for a fact that you've been inspirational for so many especially bar students and and people coming in the bar um, i can talk to that experience at least um, and I love that you've already mentioned an element of intersectionality of the fact that um, the fact that we are all different, but we can be united in a fight um, at the same time. And I just wonder, yeah, what does intersectionality mean to you? I, I don't, the, I always view it the other way up um, because I had a working life before I was a barrister. I worked in the transport industry before I was a barrister. And I appointed, I, I, it, okay, there's two particular posts. I mean, I, I didn't did this a number of times, but I appointed a woman to a post that no woman had ever held in South of England before. And I appointed a the first black supervisor on a railway station, West Reading. And, and I appointed those people because they were the best people for the job and for no other reason. And kicking down a few, a few barriers, you know, that's, uh, that's what things are about and I I had an upbringing that taught me the value of people from all sorts of different backgrounds and taught me not to fear people from different backgrounds or people that were different from me and I, I feel sorry for people who view the world around them and look at people who are different from them and go oh they're different from me they're frightening and and, and I I understand that's how people react uh, and I'm I feel sorry for them and and if I can help people understand that difference is difference for me is about vitality and um, you know, um, adding to our society not something to be frightened of mm -hmm. and uh, not necessarily an interview question but do you miss your previous career because I know you're still very passionate um, about it so do yeah, you I I, I do things in row. Well, I didn't choose to leave, and I was horribly, somewhat nastily discriminated against, and um, effectively forced to leave. Um, and you could be bitter about things like that, but what's the point being eaten up with bitterness? Why not bounce and go and do something equally fascinating and great? And gosh, isn't the bar fascinating and great to be part of? If you like an argument. You got to like an argument if you want to be a barrister. Um, so this um, kind of flowing from that um, as an employment and discrimination barrister, um, you are constantly fighting for those who have suffered discrimination, uh, sometimes discrimination that you have lived yourself in your own skin. Um, is it harder to fight cases that directly reflect uh, your own lived experience or is okay. it you know, and, and don't forget that I do cases often for employers as I do for employees. Um, do you know, I, well, I had to face that because before I transitioned, I was the classic white middle class male barrister who didn't really have a protected characteristic. You, know, I was, you float along and you're not part of any of the groups. And it's easy to dip into, into the discrimination world and think that you're not part of it. Um, I mean, I, I've done... A number of fair employment cases in Northern Ireland and actually by choice I'm an atheist so I sort of floated above the 
the uh, religious divide in Northern Ireland. And then along came this slightly enormous protected characteristic, <laughs> which I had to think about. And I have um, a wonderful colleague in Chambers who helped me think about it, who is black, uh, black and does uh, discrimination cases. And, and I was thinking about whether I was, whether I could continue to do um, cases related to, to gender reassignment. And uh, my colleague just helped me think it through from their perspective. Um, and, and we slightly laughed about the fact that I'd even thought about it. And I've now done um, quite a number of cases on both sides of the divide. And, and I am there to act as someone's barrister, not not to impose personal views or personal values. Um, I'm there to argue a case. Do you, do you then think that the bar needs intersectional feminism to develop going forward? Is it something that is needed within the profession itself? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it needs, the bar needs to reflect society. That's the thing. Um, if, if, if the bar is seriedly white, middle class male and doesn't reflect society, it won't have the confidence of society, it won't have clients who can come to it and think it, you know, it, it could be for them. And equally, there might be clients who need that experience in, in terms of life experience to, to fight the case for them, uh, and who may not have that same breadth of experience. So yeah, people who've rubbed along around the world a bit, that's very important. So how does your uh, kind of experience or your life experiences in general, um, but specifically as a trans woman at the bar, uh, how does it impact the way you kind of practice law, you, you, you act within the profession as well? Mm. Yeah, it, it, it allows me to think things through from another perspective, I think, which is always, always important. Um, I, I've been lucky. I've always been someone that, people would come and talk to. And even in my working life before, people would come to me and open up about sometimes difficulties they'd had in their life or whatever. And I think I think there's an element of showing that you are vulnerable is not quite the right word, but that that you have more than just a um, a standard life experience and that people can relate to that. Uh, it's about I mean, one of the things I talk to employers about sometimes is the value of uh, promoting and respecting difference. And what actually the reaction of a workforce to that is that they see people of difference, respected, promoted, um, valued. And that shows to a wide workforce that everyone is respected, promoted and valued, whoever you are. And it's about what you can do, not who you are. Mm -hmm. So now from kind of a different point of view, um, you've told me you were uh, an ally, in the, you have been an ally yourself. And that I just kind of, this is a question I really wanted to ask. And um, how can I, or people like me, cis women, cis privileged women at the bar, how can we be effective allies uh, to trans people, but specifically to trans women? I think, it's funny because I mean I talk about this in the introduction to the book because sort of 10 years ago when I transitioned we just had the Equality Act passed, the Gender Recognition Act was relatively new, that all seemed to be working fine and at the moment but things are rather different, we've got a rather nasty narrative about trans people being pushed by um, a, a section of people who would describe themselves as feminists um, uh, and but they they espouse a form of feminism that I don't recognise, which is about excluding people and, you know, our rights are protected by keeping you out. And the moment you start that, it's which we slice off this group and then we slice off that group and then that group and then that group, then that group. And who do you end up with? And so, um, you know, there are good and bad trans people in the world. And there are good and bad non-trans people in the world. Um, and the idea that trans people as a class are some sort of threat um, is 
an abhorrent thing to to put out there into the world. And if if anybody if people are listening to this, thinking about how they can help, how they can help is by informing themselves and by understanding that. You know, the classic way this is put is that if you meet a trans a trans woman in the in the toilets in Sainsbury's on a Saturday morning, they're there to pee. They're there, they're not there to be, you know, doing something inappropriate. Uh, and l- learn that that's so, you know, except for the tiny, tiniest little percentage of people, and that applies to all people. Inform yourself and learn that this fear is irrational. I, you know, makes me think uh, for how much I have been judged and kind of um, I've had issues in the past for being a woman. They're not necessarily issues because I'm a cis woman. (laughs) I'm never, if I'm doing something bad is not judged on the fact that I am a cis woman. Um, That has never even been part of the conversation, at least not around me. So it's a very, um, I don't know, something that is really constructed. It's (laughs) man-made. And I mean man-made a lot, but yeah. um, it's it's an incredibly interesting conversation. And I wonder whether I can kind of bring in the Gender Reform Act. Um, and I kind of wonder whether you could tell me, I mean, it has been, uh, has raised a lot of debate um, in general. And mm. uh, I know there have been criticism, there have been even from, by the criticism by the trans community itself. And I just kind of wonder what you thought was the most important uh, legal change that the act is proposing. Well, there's two, I think there's two things. Um, One is that what you're talking about, I think, is the the reform of the Gender Recognition Act so that people can self-identify as opposed to having to go through the highly medicalized process that we have. And I think what needs to be understood is that why shouldn't people's identity be respected? You know, why, why do we have to gatekeep in, in that way? We, we understand now that a proportion of people um, feel that they have an identity that's different from their natal sex. And uh, in the same way that we accepted that gay people are gay people and, and that we don't now subject gay people to... Um, horrendous electroconvulsive therapy, for example, as was the practice some years ago to quote, cure gay people. Um, I think we now know that that some people have a a gender identity that is different from their natal sex. And that that raises difficulties for them about how to live their life and the need to live in a different way. And I think the, the younger generation have got it. I mean, I talk to basketball students who go, yeah, okay, fine, we understand that. Um, and I think we need to help all the generations understand that. We haven't really got that. The other, so that's that's one. The other one, which I think is really important, because um, I made a very binary choice about my gender. You know, I turned up on that fateful morning, I turned up in chambers doing my best impression of a, a female barrister, to much to the surprise of the clerk's room. Well, not, not really surprised, they've been told, to expect me to come but um you know there came that moment when i made a sort of switch from one to the other what i've been learning about recently is are non-binary people and and they're even rarer even smaller numbers um than binary trans people and they identify rather different differently and they, they if in one sense binary trans is sort of easy to understand because at one point you were there on the spectrum and then you turn up another day and say well in fact, although I've got some things to do, I would now want to be regarded as being there on the spectrum. But by non-binary people who say I'm somewhere in the middle is uh, I had to work hard to get my head around it, uh, head around that, how they feel about themselves and to understand that there's a different category and create a different mental category where you use gender neutral pronouns for people who you know, it's not for us to say to them, that's not how they feel about themselves. That is how they feel about themselves. Fine. We need to accommodate people in society. We need, in the same way that society 30 years ago got used to MS instead of Miss and Mrs. 
we're now getting used to the fact that some people want to use MX. And that's even more complex than the, the discussion about male spaces and female spaces. And we now have people who don't comfortably fit into either potentially. And, and we have to work out how in society to accommodate comfortably people in that circumstance. And, and it's something that I've been learning about more about recently. And how do we, how do we fit them into intersectional feminism? Do we fit them into, inter do they fit? Do they need to be somewhere entirely on their own? Does it, is it, is it like um, the trumpets, you know, trying to bring down the, the walls of the castle that we say that, that there is this group of people, tiny numbers, very small numbers, who just don't fit into the binary? So would you say that- I don't have answers to, I don't have answers to some of those questions, but I, I know the, what the questions are. And it, if we talk about law reform, we then have a circumstance where we still, I mean, Britain doesn't allow people to, I mean, I have a passport with an F marker. Uh, we don't currently allow an X marker on our passports. Now, other, some, other, some other countries do, uh, more virtually by the day, but, and in a number of aspects, we don't accommodate non-binary people. So you would say that's definitely something that needs to be reformed within the Recognition Act? Well, I think, I think if, yeah, because the Gender Recognition Act, of course, only allows a change from one, one, um, one binary gender to the other. Arguably, the Equality Act, after the Taylor case that I did last September, now accommodates non-binary people and says that workplaces should, should work to accommodate non-binary people. It's a bit more flexible. But the Gender Recognition Act, of course, only recognises change from one binary gender to the other and for some for a, a and it is a small number for a small number of people that's not a comfortable place to be and shouldn't we judge our society by how we accommodate small numbers of people who need to be made comfortable I always find it quite interesting when we have these developments in law and society um, that, I mean, they're massive accomplishments, but they're still playing within the rule book that has been created um, of specific social norms. So there are only two genders. Um, we're now saying that, you know, we can maybe self-identify within one gender or the other, but it's still really binary. And um, it's progress, but often you think it could have just been like one little thing added and it would have been 10 times better. Mm -hmm. um, it can be quite frustrating or do, how do you see it do you think it's um do you see it as frustrating sometimes when it's a constant fight one after the other i think it's a mark i mean there's there's the old famous marxist expression that you judge the progress of a society by the position of women as in victorian times you know women with the impressed minority couldn't own property couldn't vote couldn't this, couldn't that, when Marx was writing. And I think that we've been through the waves of coping with people from different races. Uh, um, you know, the, the Race Relations Act, 1976, you know, within my lifetime, it, 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 was, it was lawful before 1976 to decide not to employ people of a different race. Uh, Sex Discrimination Act, 1975, that's, that's still within my lifetime perfectly legal to decide that particular forms of employment were not available to women. Now that's that's within a, a single lifetime that we've made those changes. Um, things like sexual orientation discrimination, early 2000s, 2003, I think that was. I was get that and, and um, religion and belief mixed up, which I think was 2006. You know, so only as recently as that, have we we brought in those forms of discrimination protection? There's a lot of work to do, which is why it's sometimes frustrating when you read reports that say that um, younger generations are not making things better by constantly complaining and uh, institutionalized discrimination doesn't exist. <laughs> um, but uh, I might move on very swiftly from that. Um, I just wanted to ask, when I mean you're doing so many things and um, publishing a book uh, career like just so impressive um is there a specific moment that you feel most fulfilled oh Friday afternoon when I'm at home and I and I get the cider out of the fridge possibly 
Um, I think, I'm sorry, this is going to sound a bit Miss World in some ways, but I'd love to have achieved something in a case that was difficult and, and couldn't necessarily have been done by every barrister. Um, and, and, you know, the example at the moment is Taylor, for example. And I, I knew where the right bits of that puzzle were to bring together in front of the tribunal and achieve something. And I, I don't believe every barrister in the country could have done that. Plenty of barristers could. There are other, plenty of other barristers who could have done. But I was there. I, you know, I achieved something for both for her and for a, a group of people in society. That's a special moment. You know, that's there's no no two ways about that. Every case that every case that you do well in, you get a result in that you um, know could have gone more than one way is a special moment. But that's that's recently a special moment. I find it really interesting that every time I talk to you before um, when we're launching Themis last September and even then there was a Jaguar case so every time I talk to you there is an amazing case that you've just um, won so that is uh, again not everyone is like that at all um, it's really impressive and uh, just yeah that's why we're so honored to have you here um, now yeah and I've got a couple on my table I'm talking to you from my dining room table in Somerset uh, mm -hmm. And I've got a couple of cases lurking on the corner of the dining room table, which when we when we speak again in a couple of years, we'll be talking about. I feel like you always work on the cases that everyone that is, you know, dreaming about employment and discrimination. Look, those are the cases that they have in their dreams. Like that's what they think and they would love to do. So it's uh, it's brilliant that you got there. And I think, uh, again, inspiring loads of uh, new minds um, in getting to employment and discrimination though I think um, now moving back to um, kind of intersectionality in the bar and um, what would you say is the hardest part of being an intersectional woman at the bar um, I think I think one of the things about being you have to set standards um, and um, you have to think every time you you post on Twitter, where you think, um, I mean, I, I had a wonderful opportunity in the early part of the year, I, I gave evidence to the Women in Equality Select Committee. And I, but they are, I mean, back to that, they're considering uh, whether to make some recommendations about reform of the Gender Recognition Act. And I think there were six lawyers, I think there were six of us on the call. And it was so important not to be the nutter <laughs> amongst the group um, and, and, you know, to, to be seen to say some sensible things. And I think at least one other person didn't necessarily get that right in terms of being asked for short. I remember the MPs asked us for short, sharp, direct answers, and I tried to do that. Uh, and somebody else on the call couldn't be shut up and had to grab it on and make their point. And you could see the look, it was funny, we were doing it on Parliament's version of Zoom, and you could sort of see the look on the MPs' faces of, oh, we did ask for a short answer. Mm -hmm. And, um, but anyway, that's that's part of that. And it, it's, uh, it's about setting standards of behaviour, I think. Um, and, and that's part of being at the bar as well, is that, you know, your personal behaviour is on show very clearly in the way that you do things. And I have no difficulty with that, but it does mean that you have to think about what you do and how you do it. I mean, it's this idea of respectability, right? And uh, even acts of protest yeah. and um, activism need to be done. Which, which is not to say that you shouldn't protest and you shouldn't be an activist, but you do have to think about how you act when you do that. I also love the idea that you could um, simplify and just summarize um, your experiences in a short answer <laughs> because the trans experience, I don't think it can be summarized in a, in a quick um, fire round of, uh, of answers, but um, I wouldn't imagine. Um, I had a bit of practice. Yeah, um, this is the 404th time since I transitioned that I've done a talk 
Mm -hmm. uh, involving trans in one sense or another mm -hmm. and I had to decide as we we talked about I had to decide whether trans was part of my practice mm -hmm. and one of the things that helped me was that there was um the Times newspaper was a rather different newspaper 10 years ago it had a rather different editor and a different different approach to um uh, diverse people than it does now and they carried an article about my transition just at the moment when I transitioned. And a number of people contacted me and said how helpful it had been to see someone in the public eye, particularly in the legal profession. And that uh, I've been wondering about whether I sort of got over the transition period and then sort of screwed the lid back down on it and didn't, that wasn't anything I mentioned. And I had half a dozen or so people contact me after the Times article and say just how wonderful it had been to see someone out there. And I thought, well, if I can do a bit of good like that, yeah. let's carry on. And so I keep, I've got a little notice board in my, in my dining room study that I use here. And I keep a little note on the corner. And as I say, this is the 404th. I love that you keep a record. And uh, I hope you keep a record also of the messages you get, because I'm sure, I mean, again, I myself, within my circle of people, I know that you have inspired a lot of people. So I, I hope there is a record of all the kind of messages that you've received of uh, that you have helped or even just supported. We all have dark, you know, we all have difficult moments. We all have times when you think, oh, how am I going to cope? How am I going to get through the weekend? Why did that week go like it did? Why have these things appeared in the way that they have? And it's you do have to keep some of those things nearby so that you can sort of polish the good times and remember them uh, and the good things because we, you know we all have go through difficulties in life and it is it's important that's an important way of supporting yourself is to recognize i mean when you're a junior barrister you won't win every case that's the whole point even as a senior barrister i can tell you you don't win every case uh, but particularly when you're a junior barrister, you can get sent to do things which are a bit hopeless sometimes. And that's part of, you know, learning your, your trade at the bar. And But you will do cases as a junior barrister where you've helped somebody who probably wouldn't have had help otherwise. And you will win things that they might not have been able to win for themselves on their own. And that's, they're nice. You tap those into your knapsack. You shouldn't shouldn't get too self-satisfied or, or too um too blasé or you know too convinced of your own wonderfulness but you do need those you need to keep those little positives tucked away somewhere to think about uh would you say that's the best part of being at the bar what's the best part we talked about the hardest thing of being an intersectional woman at the bar. what's the best bit what's the best bit i i mean i'm a male git <laughs> I, I like arguing a case. I like, I like arguing through something difficult and persuading and attempting to uh, particularly persuade a court or a judge uh, or a tribunal to the view that your client would like and finding a way to do that. And it, it's a very satisfying thing to do when you can get a group of people it's actually a very feminist thing to do in some ways to get a group of people to agree with you and do you know actually there's some female techniques in terms of group dynamic tremendously useful in court work in terms of finding ways of having that group of people around you and it can be it can be the tribunal it can be people on the other side of a case to agree with you and finding communalities um, and that's decried sometimes. There are people who say, no, feminism should all be about the fist and the fight and all the rest of it. But that isn't always the successful technique. Uh, so, you know, using those different skills, tremendously important. And what would you say is the most pressing issue within the profession, so at the bar at the moment? I think equality. I think, in fact, I've just been doing some work with the Bar Council because the Bar Council have uh, just started to monitor earnings for barristers. And I think 
I know we're going to be a bit shocked by some of the results because there is still, you know, uh, sex stroke gender is hardwired in society. You know, it, it, it remains the position that, that maternity leave is significantly more taken up than paternity leave. It remains the position that women are much more likely to take career breaks than men. And we, we haven't, um, is it a problem, question mark? Um, it certainly is for people who come back into practice and find that they're earning less than their, their male counterparts would and they're just as good, but, but they have had four or five years out of practice or four or five years of low, lower level of practice. And I think there, there's, there's work to be done in that area in terms of balancing things up properly and working out how we do that in an appropriate way. And I'm sure intersectionality will be a massive issue that will be highlighted in the rates that we're- Oh yeah, doing. absolutely. I'm, I'm sure it will. And, and the fact that, you know, people have got multiple, uh, 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 a woman from a deprived background is going to have so you know, that difficulty in a stronger form than a woman from a privileged background. And we have to work through those things as a society because that's not right. It's not how it should be. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it probably it might be exactly the same, but what do you think is the most pressing issue within your specific area of law? So within employment law or discrimination law? I think, I think we need to look at, uh, I think it's still the case that the number of silks, for example, is that there's a strong male emphasis if, if you look at the number of silks. I mean, we did, um, Old Square did particularly well last year in that we had, we had four employment silks. Uh, Deshpal Panasar was the only man. So we had three women and one man. We had two women of color. And we had four different religions across the four. So, but, but that's frankly remarkable. If you, if you tot up the number of silks and, and you look at the male-female split at that level um, and you look at who's in the AT regularly and what have you, those sorts of things, there is still work to be done in terms of balancing up the profession. I mean, we have, we have some, it, it doesn't impact on individuals. We have, I mean, Old Square, we have some amazing in, individuals. We had, uh, we had, um, Jane McNeil, who sort of invented employment law as our head of chambers a few years ago. We have Joel Mumbala and Rebecca Turk and Catherine Newton, who are, you know, amazing female silks. But that is not reflected completely across the profession and needs to be. Yeah, um, I just kind of want to add, we're almost at the end of the interview, but I just really wondered if there was, um, if you could choose one question about anything. So it could be um, to do with your practice or your life at the bar that you would like me to ask you, what would it be? Um, what would it be? I, I'm going to answer it. <laughs> Actually, yeah, well, that was my next question, so please go ahead. Well, I, let, me, let me ask ask myself my question. I, I am sad, I am really sad that a slice of feminism, which calls itself gender critical, sees trans women in such a negative light. And I would like to know how to reach out to those people and to show them that trans people are not a threat and are not frightening and are not promoting trans people's rights isn't going to diminish women's rights generally. And that, that I, I would like to find a way to do that. And I don't know how to. And I, if I could solve what, you know, that's, Ask, this is almost like the magic wand question. If I could wave my magic wand and find something, it's to, to find something that convinces people with that view or allows people with that view to understand that trans people are not a threat and are not a problem. 
and that equality equality is not a pie for dividing up equality is i mean what do they say when the the tide comes in it floats all the boats you know if if equality if we get equality right for everyone we all advance but people don't there are, there is a proportion of people who don't feel like that and it makes me sad and i don't know how to solve that or help them um, or help everybody help them i mean I don't, that's arrogant i don't mean it like that to help us all to advance and and i'd like to find a solution to that uh, if i could well, please share if you do. <laughs> I, I'm sure you, you may know this, but um, we as Themis, we launched as a explicitly trans inclusive yes. space and um, we were attacked because of it as well on multiple occasions on multiple platforms. And we obviously, um, I, I remain certain of this, um, unfortunately, social media platforms and online spaces are not the place to have this conversation. Um, because it just never comes out. It, it, it's an echo chamber, and all you do is it gets louder and and more vibrant, and and more horrible. And I'm sure that's you're absolutely right. That's not the place. Um, and I, but I don't know the answer. And if I knew the answer, I'd be out promoting it. Oh please do! <laughs> like if you find anything, share it because we would love to um, know how to. Uh, to assist as well ourselves um so last two questions uh the first one is you have a favorite uh song book movie um possibly feminist um that you would like to share or plug in um do you know what i was watching the other week was um 27 dresses you've not seen it no, I actually didn't know. An American lady who runs, um, uh, she, she runs weddings for other people. And it's about her finding her perfect person. And I was just, I, I, I had a bit of free time and I was watching that. And I loved that. Um, in terms of book, well, I have to say that Christine Burns, uh, who's a bit, bit of a trans feminist icon, has written a couple of books about how trans rights were promoted and you know how the, how the battle was won for things like the gender recognition act and her writing is so honest and straightforward and out there that that it's an example and an inspiration to other people so um song well i had um i had an association with germany in the 1980s and I can sing 99 Red Balloons in German if you really want me to, but I'm not going to impose that. Um, my, my Nina impression, who was the artist. I mean, if you're up for it, I would love to. No, 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 it's not. It would be immensely unfair. It's too hot for but, it. <laughs> but I do find myself um, singing about um, Captain Kirk and fire engines and whatever you, they, anybody who understands the lyrics of the song will know what I'm talking about. Um, and so she's just a great, she was a great artist and I, I loved her songs. But thank you. And uh, obviously your book as well. Oh, and sorry. Um, <laughs> did I, did I mention that I had a book out? <laughs> I love that. Obviously. I have to tell you to plug it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny as you know, it's funny, you're just talking about nothing at all. And and then all of a sudden, um, you know, it suddenly becomes relevant that there's, you know, it, you can't keep it out of the picture. And um, all we, we're talking about some other form of feminism. And, you know, we're just talking away and magically the book appears. And I, I it's funny how with a book to promote how it, it comes into ooh, every okay. conversation. You shouldn't keep it out of the picture. I mean, it's such a it's such progress and it's something that we all need to learn more about so you should always keep it in the picture I, what i have to say is such hard work i mean it, we it, it's a completely joint effort between myself and nikki newbegin in chambers and the two of us kept our noses collective noses to the grindstone in terms of writing it and it's such hard work i mean it's only 318 pages or whatever but you have to think about every line you know i can you justify what you're saying? Is it, are you expressing the right thing? Are you expressing it in the right way? Um, 
and and I've never worked so hard as as writing a book, or writing writing a, a legal practitioner's text because mm. you've got to think about it in quite that way. Yeah. How so, long did it take? Well, it's been two years in the brewing, and um, it only got finished off because I I had a three week case before Christmas that settled just before it was due to start, and of course at that time of year you're never going to get anything else in place. So I just said to the clerks, nothing else, look, and, and pulled the duvet over my head and just got with it. <laughs> now that the first edition's out there, we already have some ideas for the second edition in a couple of years' time. But and it's especially in a book that recognizes how important language is. I imagine there is mm. a lot of thought going into the, all of that um, kind There's of an entire chapter on glossary and you mm -hmm. know like that. So mm -hmm. And I would be delighted. Um, thank you for saying. I think you said that you you'd got a copy. It 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 really. We hope it's a useful book. That's the whole point. And that means that people who use it, please please comment on it. Please write to us and say we'd prefer you to do this in future, or what about this, or you've missed this bit out. That's that's just wonderful. I mean, write some nice reviews for us as well. But we would love to have some constructive criticism because we recognize that we we have some ideas already about how we could make a second edition better and we'd love to have that from people who've um found it useful but can suggest some improvements mm -hmm. i love that i'll definitely do that and i'll um make sure again to link the book and uh let's ask everyone to write a review or a comment absolutely. amazon waterstones it's amazing actually mm -hmm. It's on Amazon, mm -hmm. and it's like you're. A you can search your name on Amazon; something comes up. <laughs> you don't have to search your name on Google anymore. <laughs> no, it's true. Anyway, uh, so Lino. my my last question for tonight, and then I'm going to let you go because it's literally we're both melting. I'm sure. Um, so we, um, Femis has been working a lot in this last year, but there is so much more that we want to do. So um, what would you like, is there something like project, event, or anything else that you would like Themis to focus on in the future? I think um, for Themis, I think, uh, I mean, I found it something to write about in terms of um, a, a slice. And, and I'm not sure that there's a, there are some feminist books that have come out recently, particularly from the, the gender critical feminists about how they're right and their form of feminism is, should be respected and what have you. I would love to see things argued from an intersectional perspective um, and a, a collection of something arranged by Themis would be how wonderful that would be. Um, my publishers, I think, would be interested. Um, but I think, I think, I mean, you asked earlier about, is there something you can do to help? Well, here's something you can do to help and to say, this is true feminism. This is intersectional feminism where we get together and we draw people in and we don't, like I was talking about earlier, we don't slice off bits and say, no, you know, you're not our sort of feminist. We don't want you. Um, and some writing about why that's the right thing to do might be a great idea. I love that. Um, I mean, the entire, our entire kind of motto is the fact that we want to platform differences and to platform different types of being a woman, because for how much a trans woman may not have the same experience of a cis woman, a white woman doesn't have the experience of a black woman, for instance. So we're all about giving space to different different women and just yeah diversity instead of how about you know it doesn't i don't know what the number would be but if you had 50 different women who who've made it in the law in different ways and each of those wrote you a couple of thousand words there's a book That's and how inspiring that would be for um women coming into the law to see how different women have made it. I mean, there are there are um, there are examples and icons. I mentioned Jane McNeil, who was head of my chambers. Um, there's Vicky Phillips, who's you know uh, the um, certainly senior employment person at Thompsons, for example. 
there are a whole series there there are, we talked about some great silks you know, there's becky tuck from my chambers um who have made it in that way and i bet they all have an interesting story to tell and how inspiring that would be for people coming into the profession to see what it was like you know what how other people have have um, made their way yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is sort of what we're trying to do with this blog series. We're interviewing Shiro's, which is just amazing women telling us their story and their thoughts. So um, that's a brilliant idea. And uh, we would love to do that. So um, it's going to go on my to do list. Um, so that's going to be my next project. Um, but in the meantime, I just really want to thank you. This was inspiring. It was so nice. I'm sorry again for the heat <laughs> and uh, no, no. We're just doing this on a Monday afternoon in uh, crazy uh, Sahara weather. Um, but I just really want to thank you. And uh, yeah, we just uh, will post your book and anything that we can do to advertise your amazing work. We're here for it. Thank you.